Most two-stroke garden shed equipment will have this carburetor design in it. I'm getting all nervous now. Moment of truth. How good did I do? Well, it's my air box. So that'll go onto there. And then you just pull out these two screws and it takes the whole carburetor off. The bottom part is the housing for your valves and the adapter plate. This is a carburetor off of my paramotor. Look at that, there's a truck. You can see on the side it says Walbro. Walbro is a really common carburetor. This is where the fuel goes in. This is where it goes actually into the crankshaft area. This is a big, small carburetor, if that makes any sense. You see carburetors like this on weed eaters and chainsaws and all kinds of stuff. This one's actually made in Japan. You can see where it says J-A-P-A-N. So right off the bat you should be thinking J-I-S. What's J-I-S? Japanese Industrial Standard. But it's a different kind of screw than you have on a lot of everything else. If you've ever noticed, carburetor screws are sometimes hard to get a good grip on. It's because you're using the wrong screwdriver. This is the JIS screwdriver on the right, Japanese industrial standard. And then this is a number two standard Phillips screwdriver. You'll notice that the JIS has a flat tip like it's been buzzed off. And then it's also got a different angle to it. The American number two is a lot steeper. So whenever I do a carburetor like this, I'll get the kit for it. In this case, it's a K10WB. I just lay everything out. If you use pump gas with ethanol in it, You'll find that your diaphragm like this gets worn out. It basically just gets all floppy and soft. Um, these are your fuel screens or fuel strainers. This is your uh, needle for your needle and seat. That's the rocker. That's the uh, crossbar for it. There's a little screw that holds the bar and all that in place. And then you'll notice that there's all these different uh, gaskets. So I just lay them out by similar type and that way as I'm moving through the carburetor I can just grab from this pile and everything's pretty organized. Now this looks new but it's not. All the springs were full of garbage. When you get garbage all over the outside of the carburetor it makes it hard to keep it clean. You can still see I've got a little bit of crud here. So let's wipe that off. But basically anywhere there's a spring, anywhere there's a nook or cranny, you're going to find that you get all kinds of sand. Sand and grime on the outside or on your gloves doesn't matter, but your gloves are going to be touching tiny little parts on the inside, and that sand can wreak havoc if it gets inside the carburetor. That's why there's so many strainers and things to keep things clean. So if you clean the outside well, it'll save you a lot of grief later when you're in the inside. I use a pick to clean out the screw slots, because if you don't, your screwdriver won't get seated in there properly, and you'll strip the screw. So I'm going to support it. I'm pushing in real hard uh, from here so that I don't slip out. I want to keep these screws as good and nice and uh, sharp on the back side as I can. I do use thread locker and torque paint on these screws, so I need a good grip on them to get them out again. If there's anything that you can do to remember how this goes before you take it apart, that helps. In this case, you've got that little alignment pin, so I'm not going to worry too much about it. So my paramotor's been a little bit hard to start, and I've checked the decompression hole in the cylinder, and it's just completely clear. And then there's also been a lot of fuel that's leaking off the carburetor. And somebody used pump gas in this for a long time without using Clear 88. And that causes these diaphragms to just go to crap. So what I want to show you is you see all the grit that gets in there. You know, because obviously it's exposed, there's a hole. So that's one problem. Look at the new diaphragm versus the old one. Can you see how this one's just worn out? I mean, it's full of grit and garbage, and that's one problem. But the other problem is, look how floppy it is. Ethanol gas basically eats carburetor parts. Stuff like this, it just makes it go really floppy and you lose performance. But still, go Huskers. Just going to go around and loosen this up with a pick. It's a good idea to have some tweezers on hand and a good idea to have a pick. It's funny, but a sharp pokey stick can actually help keep you from tearing things up. You saw that that was hooked into this. So this actually pushes that up and down. But look how floppy that is. I cannot emphasize enough. I mean, it's just like ethanol gas sucks. It just makes a mess. And these wear out even with even if you use uh, Avgas or Clear 88, which contains no ethanol. So I've got these both wiped off. And you can see there's just a marked difference between the two of them. This one's just so worn out. It's just so defeated. And they, you know, it could be worse. I was still flying on this. But you can see it's just like there's, I don't know, it's like loose extra skin. So if you push on this part here, guess what's going to happen? It's like turning off the fuel pump and it just dies. 
another way to kill your engine you know like make it quit running not destroy it nice little black vomit coming from that things work so much better once there's no sand in it this is what's under the diaphragm you've got this gasket wants none of it right, and i'm just going to put this in the same orientation on the paper now this screen here is in great shape i don't have any blockage because i use a fuel filter so i'm not going to worry about that i am going to replace a needle and seat on this because the tip of the needle can get worn out. Yeah, and I can't stress how nice it is to have a GIS screwdriver for this. It makes such a big difference. You don't have to pull the screw out all the way. Just get it up a little bit. This is where your tweezers come in. This is my little watch tools kit. All right, so here's how we do this. Just pull this one out because you get a new one. So the objective is to replace the worn out parts like that diaphragm is my main goal, but then also to clean out anything that needs to be cleaned out. This one's actually really pretty clean. It's not very old either. So you see the tip of that is not metal. It's made out of some kind of uh, rubber. It's squishy. You can feel it with the tweezers. Feel it slide off. So that rubber can wear out. When you put fuel into the carburetor, the fuel goes in this one right here. I'm going to spray through it and you'll watch it come out right there. You see the fuel come out through there. I mean it's not fuel, it's cleaner. While that looks just like a squid eyeball, that's actually the seat. That's the other sealing surface with your needle. That little rubber tip thing that I showed you, and those together block off the flow of fuel. See that screw's been like mangled. I think this has been quote unquote serviced before. Okay, I'm going to tune this screwdriver. Let's see if this fits any better. That's better. You can hear those click when you pull them off. You don't want to over tighten them, but you certainly want to get them tight enough to where they cold weld a little bit like that. With that screen there, you should be able to clean it from both sides without having to replace it. I'm going to match this to the one that I need and lay it out. I'll show you once everything's out. Or now, whatever. These little screens, it's a good idea to replace them if they need it, but if they don't, just leave them alone. That's clear. That's why it's nice having an inline fuel filter. You can catch all the junk before it gets to your carburetor and still be able to get fuel so you don't have some kind of stupid engine out issue. So here you can see the two different jets. This one has kind of a metallic sticker, a tamper resistant one. I believe this is the high jet and as I look I can see the H right there. So it's better to have these be too rich than too lean. Uh, the reason being is you've got lubrication and everything involving you wreck your motor. That's why they got the sticker on that one. The low jet or the idle jet you can adjust as needed. The higher you go in altitude, the thinner the air is and then you have to lean it out a little bit. Anyway, that's those two screws you can see down in there. I'm just going to flush these out from this side. Just in case there's any sand or contamination from me getting into it or getting past from the teardown. I don't see anything else really that needs attention at this point. I'm going to blast through some of these jets with this hose. Um, everything's clear on this carburetor. It really doesn't need anything. But it does need the new gaskets, obviously, because it's leaking for one. And two, it's just time. It's just good maintenance. See a little green torque paint pen? When you tear stuff down, you, like I say, you get stuff in the, just about everywhere. This one's really clean as far as ports go. Um, but see these two little holes? You've got little spots here and here, and if you just squirt the stuff in there, make sure you use eye protection. The product I like to do for carburetors, I'm not paid to say this, but I really like B12 Chem Tool. The stuff's just amazing. The straw is really handy. So that's what I use because it's effective. So I'm just sharing that with you. You're welcome. I'll leave a link in the description where you can find some. There's a fork in the road. I can either put this back together or leave it apart. And I'm just going to do the opposite side tear down on that and then come back. And that way when I spray cleaner, it doesn't affect the, the other parts. The cleaner is as bad as ethanol gas is. So I use my JST screwdriver. Also, I'll leave a link in the description. These are worth their weight in gold. You improve the quality of your work because you're not marring or stripping your screws. The other nice thing is that you can get a good torque with these that you wouldn't be able to get. You really feel what you're doing because you've got a direct hookup without it sliding or stripping. So this side's pretty easy. If you look closely at the strainer, you can see there's a little bit of debris in there, but not much. So we're going to 
flush that out. If you don't have an inline fuel filter, you would not leave these in there or try to flush them out. You just get rid of it. So the key to doing these, for those who want to know, is you use a small socket. In fact, we'll just show you on this one. That other one's itty bitty teeny tiny and I definitely am going flying tomorrow. So I don't want to mess this up. Uh, but you just you hook it on one side and pull. Or if you can get it to twist up and out. And get your tweezers and just pull it out. Here's the new one. The new one's actually a lot more fine. You can use a pencil eraser or you can use any kind of uh, socket that fits that. But if you use a pencil eraser, make sure you use one that's clean and then also make sure that you uh, get right in the middle of it. Just push it in like that. So I don't see any other issues or problems need to be addressed at this time. It's really clean. I'm just gonna give it a little flush. So you see on this, you've got the same kind of thing. It just stretches out and gets a little bit sloppy, floppy, loose. Time does it, fuel does it, uh, vibration does it, and uh, ethanol does it. Oh, you look at this, it's a little bit dirty there. So we'll flush and clean that, wipe it down. See, it's got a little bit of an off color. So off camera, I'm blowing things off after just about everything. Just make sure that everything's really clean. It's not rocket surgery, but I still want to treat it kind of like surgery. That concludes the teardown portion of this two-stroke carburetor rebuild series. Uh, there's going to be two videos. There's going to be another one coming out in a week, so be sure to subscribe and hit the bell. You don't want to miss out on that. If you stay tuned, and this has uh, been more than a week since this video came out, I'll have an end card so that you can conveniently continue on your journey to putting this carburetor back together. Sure, appreciate you coming by. Stay tuned. Here's a bonus footage with some license plates. Bonus footage at the end. Big shout out to Daryl Holiday from Columbus, Ohio. He sent me in some mail. I love mail. <laughs> it is seven miles to the post office. So when you get there day after day after day and there's no mail, it's like, eh. So it's really exciting when there is. So thanks for that. Appreciate it. Has that got mail on it? This one's going to be displayed prominently. And it's got the don't mess with me non-reflective. Dude, that is so stinking cool. I'm hanging this one up now by my Ron Paul poster. I absolutely love that. <laughs> Thanks, Daryl. You're the man. So, Ohio, birthplace of aviation. Ohio, beautiful birthplace of aviation. I say that's the right brother's plane. <laughs> They're pretty serious about the birthplace of aviation stuff, and you know I love aviation, so. It says, Dear Brian, I send you the plates for a few reasons. One, you asked for them. <laughs> Uh, you were the first YouTube mechanic who helped me out with a video. Oh, the Mitsubishi Galant heater control one, yeah. The heater shut motor. Uh, you're a great guy. Thank you. I thought you might really appreciate the special extremely limited edition RP 2012 stuff on it. Huge difference. So this one you can pick up, like I say, a mile, mile and a half away with the LiDAR gun. This one, it's going to be pretty close. That was actually a really good job. Whoever did that, they did a great job on it. <laughs> That's awesome. It's cool that he knows that I'm a uh, Ron Paul fell. Yours in Liberty, Daryl Holiday. Daryl, you're the man. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I can't believe that you parted with your Ron Paul plate either. <laughs> but uh, for whatever your reason is for sending them, I always appreciate it. So thanks for sending me some plates.